Hey, Ryan. I'm ready. Here you go. Thank you. Stop. Let's get, stick that there. Dice on the second computer, sorry. Oh, that's fine. Um, I'm all set. All set? Yep. Okay. We're good. Sometimes sometimes the pencil and paper is a technology that's uh, more dependable. Can we get this second mic on too? Uh, a second mic. For the room. Oh, okay, sure. Thank you. Uh, that one's for the live stream, and this one's for these people. <laughs> Yeah, that might not be a bad idea. I can I can project, but uh, uh do, do you want to take the on? Snap that on there. Like, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, let's get that out. Hmm. Turn this around. Can you hold this? Yes. Good. And then when you are ready to speak, there is an on button on that to hold. Uh, so hold that for on, and then you can slip this up so you don't. You can just turn it on it. now, and I'll be quiet. Okay. I think that should be good. Yeah. 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 Nothing? There we go. Okay. Yeah. Didn't even have to ask you to be quiet. All right. Hello, welcome, and thank you for coming to just one of the many events associated with the 2017 MSU Comics Forum. And if you haven't heard yet, we are celebrating our 10th anniversary this year. So I wanted to start. So I wanted to start by thanking you for maintaining and growing our academic community interest in comics study. So thank you very much. Um, and I'd like to continue this celebration uh, with the Wharton Center. The Wharton Center is a performing arts center on campus and they are helping us celebrate our 10th anniversary here at the Forum with a comics inspired show. This is the Tony Award winning Broadway musical Fun Home that was originally a graphic novel by Alison Bechtel. And uh, this is happening this summer here on campus and uh, we have a very special gift for one audience member. They are giving away a pair of tickets to Fun Home, and the way we're doing this is if you look behind the seat, there should be a golden ticket 
under one of your seat backs. Anybody find it? Wave it high and proud. Under the seat that you're sitting on. Ah. you did not get the golden ticket with the instructions on how to retrieve your tickets, uh, you can go to wartoncenter.com. So thank you to the Wharton Center. And I'd like to begin by introducing you to James Curtis, who is the chair of the Capital City Comic Con, who has some exciting news to tell us about. So let's welcome James. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you very much. Take a few minutes before we get to the, the James we all want to see today. <laughs> so as Ryan mentioned, my name is James Curtis. I'm chair of Capital City Comic Con. Um, I want to thank Ryan for the invitation. Uh, thank you very much for having me. And uh, congratulations again on your 10-year anniversary for the MSU Comics Farm. That's uh, an astounding achievement. So again, uh, I'm glad. <laughs> um, so um, we're entering our third year of Capital City Comic Con, and um, it's, it's on market calendars for Saturday, August 26th, uh, here at the Breslin Center. Um, last year, um, we were happy to host about 2,000 people, and uh, I want to take a little bit of time to talk about our event uh, and uh, some exciting news I'd like to share. Um, so Capital City Comic Con, um, real briefly, our mission, we break down into what we call the four C's, and it's comics, creators, collectibles, and our community. And really what that means is that uh, we're, we're a creator-focused show. You know, for example, um, our special guests last year were Ryan Stegman, uh, Jason Howard, Ryan Claydor, Bill Meserlope. So um, to us, um, the real rock stars, the real stars of the, the Comic-Con universe are the creators. And um, moving forward, we want to be the type of convention that really honors um, the people that create the worlds that we love. And uh, with that, we are a Lansing convention. And, um, Capital City Comic Con is owned by Lansing um, residents, and uh, we want to do things for our community as well. Uh, among those is um, we've, we've partnered with the Capital Area Literacy Coalition and their mission uh, to help fight illiteracy in our uh, community. They're a wonderful organization. They've been going for 30 years strong, and uh, very proud to, to say that with support from um, uh, our attendees, we were able to fund the Literacy Coalition was $1,700 of donation, so we're very, very proud to be able to do that. And uh, what I'm here to talk about today is the MSU Comic Studies Scholarship. They were also very, very proud uh, to support um, an amazing, unique program here at MSU. So without further, further ado, uh, I want to talk about uh, the 2017 Original Art Scholarship in Comic Studies. This is exclusively offered to students here at M MSU um, to encourage the study of comic art. One scholarship is awarded based on artistic merit, uh, determined by a jury. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, our 2016 scholarship uh, recipient, Grace Fish. I think I saw Grace in the back. So let me just a uh, quick round of applause for Grace. Um, there were many, many outstanding submissions uh, this year. And Grace stood out um, both as a skilled artist and a storyteller, which are the fundamentals of, of sequential art. And um, as part of uh, winning a scholarship, um, Grace was awarded $500, and uh, she had created the official art for the 2016 con, which you can see in all its glory right here. So. <laughs> um, Grace did a wonderful job. We believe that it truly captured the essence of our convention, specifically the community aspect of it, and uh, we're very proud to share it far and wide, um, and, and hopefully embarrass her as much as we could along the way. So, <laughs> um, so with that, I'm very proud to announce the 2017 uh, Comic Scholarship, and very proud to share that due to um, the support of our community and the success of our convention last year, we were able to increase the scholarship this year to a commission of $1,000. Um, and so this year, um, we're, uh, we 
begin application process um, tomorrow morning. Actually, you can start out. Do any students here at MSU? Great, perfect. So pay attention. <laughs> um, the, the Comic Con scholarship is a commission of $1,000 to create our original art for Capital City Comic Con. Um, we're also pleased to share a commemorative letter and certificate. You'll have a dedicated table to highlight and sell your work at our convention. Um, you'll be featured as our um, Comic Con commemorative art for the entire event. Um, you'll have a, a featured in a dedicated insert, the Lansing City Pulse, which, as you know, is numbers in the thousands in distribution. Our event program, promotional materials, um, really far and wide. And also, they'll be reproduced as 11 by 17 prints, which are sold in order to keep funding our scholarship. So it all goes back to, to future scholarships. Um, so to apply, submit your application um, with uh, JPEGs or PDF samples of the original comic art. Um, sure, uh, splash pages and art is, is acceptable, but preference would be to completed books and sequential art um, for the nature of uh, comic studies. Um, brief cover letter, um, group of academic enrollment, and applications can be submitted no later than April 14th, and then uh, artwork submitted May 26th. So that's all the, uh, the really dry, not fun part of the scholarship, but uh, uh, as, as chair of Capital City Comic Con, I can say that uh, this, is, this is truly my favorite thing to do uh, as part of the convention, is to be able to support artists in our own community who are um, studying for comics and uh, looking to do that in, as their career. So, um, that's all I have to say. Uh, thanks very much. Visit CapCityComicCon.com to learn more and to apply for the scholarship. Thank you. Thank you, James. That is incredible. I thought the $500 scholarship this year, this past year, was generous. So, um, wow. Uh, I am shocked and humbled. Thank you for doing that. Um, while I gather my thoughts on that, <laughs> I'm going to do my best to move forward with some acknowledgments, and I'm pretty sure I've acknowledged my role as the director of the forum a few dozen times already, but I also wanted to make it known that there are a number of entities associated with the MSU Comics Forum that not only allow this show to happen, but also make up for my hulking shortcomings. So let's start with our sponsors. To begin with, our bronze sponsors, we have VRD Printing, who do the immaculate job of printing all the posters that James illustrated. Matrix, the Center for Digital Humanities and Social Sciences, who host our website. The Michigan State University Comic Art and Graphic Novel Podcast is also a new podcast here at MSU. It's been going for six months now, and you can find it at this address. MSU Muslim Studies, who put on the Miss Marvel reading discussion on Wednesday nights. Our silver sponsors, MSU Special Collections Library, which is home to the largest public collection of comics in the world. So thank you for your help. Uh, Capital Area District Libraries is a new sponsor of ours, and I emphasize that because I'm at fault for the misspelling on the posters and the postcards. So it is district, not district. And our gold sponsors are the Residential College and the Arts and Humanities, who not only give us this space, but also help put on this uh, forum. Gary Hoppenstand, who has been instrumental in comic studies and instrumental in seeing this comics forum through. Thank you, Gary. The MSU Department of English. And for our platinum sponsors, we have the Journal of Popular Culture, who have been with us since the very beginning of these 10 years and the Department of Art, Art History, and Design, who coincidentally are forming, in fact have formed, the MSU Comic Art and Graphic Novel Minor, which is an interdisciplinary minor between the Art and English departments at MSU. It is housed in the Art Department. And if you would like any information on that, please. <laughs> If you'd like any information on that, please feel free to email me or check out our website, art.msu.edu. So, uh, finally, I would like to thank a few committee members, uh, starting with Jason Larson, who is our new panel, I'm sorry, promotions coordinator. Uh, so if you've heard about this event, either through a postcard, through a poster, on television, radio, uh, print media, 
It's quite likely because of him. Uh, he came in guns blazing as our new promotions coordinator, and I want to thank him a bunch. So can we give him a hand, please? In his second year, still guns blazing, is Zach Cruzy. He is our panel coordinator and uh, has really taken the reins in this spot. Uh, Zach was a former event director in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and I am proud to have gone to his show, and I'm really proud to have stolen him over to our show. So Zach, thank you for all your work getting the panel discussions ready for tomorrow. And finally, the man, the myth, the legend, Jay Jaycott, the only one who's been associated with this program with the MSU Comics Forum longer than I have. Uh, he is our Artist Alley Coordinator, and we'll be bringing dozens of folks here tomorrow. So Jay, thank you for all your help. And if you would like to get involved with the MSU Comics Forum, either as a sponsor or as a volunteer, please come see me after the show tonight, uh, or during the day tomorrow. I'll be around all day, and uh, you can either chat with me or send me an email at msucomicsforum at gmail.com. So, now comes the time we've all been waiting for, which is our keynote speaker, James Stern who has worked for seemingly every major comics publisher from Marvel to Fantagraphics to Drawn and Quarterly, and I'm sure I'm forgetting a few. He's also a co-founder of the esteemed Center for Cartoon Studies in White River Junction, Vermont, uh, which I'm pretty sure you'll hear about tonight. Uh, but what James might not tell you about tonight are that there are a number of awards that he's garnered from the Zero Grant for Self-Publishing to the Eisner Award, which is the Oscars of comics, essentially, and even Time Magazine named his comic, The Gollum's Mighty Swing, Graphic Novel of the Year. So, without further ado, please help me welcome James Stern. Thanks. Thank you. Great, can, can everybody hear me okay? Um, great, uh, thank you, Ryan, for all of your efforts in putting all this together, uh, you and your colleagues, um, what a great, community here, so many wonderful resources to make and study comics between uh, that collection and now this minor and the Comic-Con and bringing people together. That's really, um, it's very, very inspiring. Um, and I'm really humbled to, to stand here before you um, and talk about comics. I guess if I had to thank one more, um, I want to thank comics, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. I. Uh, I've been making comics my whole life, and, and now, as we live in a, a time, at least for me, where I feel very uh, afraid often and anxious for various reasons, uh, I find comics just really reassuring. It's the one thing that I feel I have control over, and I can take a lot of experiences and fears and doubts and hopes and fears, things I want to teach, uh, things uh, I want to express, and, and kind of put them in little boxes and try to make sense of the world that way. So, so thank you, comics, for bringing us all together. All right. Um, where will I start? I was born in New York City, moved out to the suburbs when I was about three and a half. And New York City, as you well know, is the hometown of so many superheroes. I was obsessed with comics growing up. And any time I was in Manhattan, I half expected to catch a glimpse of Spider-Man or Daredevil swinging around the rooftops. It seemed possible that an epic battle could break out at any minute. And reading comics made being in the city more exciting. I now live in a small Vermont village of White River Junction. And I sometimes think maybe someday I will create a comic that will affect the way people think about White River Junction. The junk, as we lovingly refer to it as. And I know I'll be successful if I ever get to witness this. This is a little comic I did for a, a guy named Leonard Marcus, who was interviewing cartoonists who do work for children, uh, children's books. And uh, he asked everybody to do two pages about the city. So this was my city comic. Uh, I went back to, to my roots uh, of, of comic loving. 
And when I think about my influences, uh, and if I had to carve out a Mount Rushmore, um, Charles Schultz would certainly be uh, one of those heads. Uh, Peanuts was this simple, profound comic strip. Uh, it seemed like the only strip on the newspaper page that actually had a soul. The other big influence was, was Marvel Comics, although Jack Kirby didn't draw this cover. Uh, he did create the Fantastic Four. And this is actually the very first comic that I ever bought at a shopping mall in Paramus Park. You can see it's, it's very well read. When I went off to college, Big Ten College, University of Wisconsin, hence the badger on my poster, uh, I discovered underground comics. Uh, I think the last generation that will be coming of age uh, pre-internet. <laughs> so discovering underground comics was like very, very exciting. Um, and it was very liberating in a lot of ways. And through uh, a friend who, who introduced me to them in his collection, uh, I discovered Robert Crumb and Justin Green and Trina Robbins and Kim Deitch and Art Spiegelman, who of course later went on to create Mouse. Uh, Art's been a very important figure for me over the years. I got to internship at Raw Magazine and uh, learned a lot from how he put together his work. Another huge influence, huge influence on me was McDoodle Street by Mark Allen Stamity. Uh, I bought this book uh, at the University Bookstore, who was on the remainder table. And it was a collection of 19, I believe, 1970s strips um, that appeared in the Village Voice. And what the underground cartoons and Mark Allen Stamini, uh, they, they, yeah, they gave me permission. Uh, when I went off to college, my dream was to draw the Fantastic Four and, and, and work for Marvel. And although I don't think I put that work in the slideshow, I actually went on to do a Fantastic Four comic. Um, but that was, you know, it was a roundabout way. Um, I knew I could never draw superheroes in the way. It took me too long to, to, to work. Um, and I thought, well, for a while, I, I didn't think I could make comics. But when I discovered the underground cartoons uh, in all the different styles and all the different approaches and all the different subject matters, it made me realize that there was a place at the table for myself as well. Uh, there was a student newspaper at University of Wisconsin called the Daily Cardinal. I think it still exists. God bless its liberal soul. And I started doing, inspired by the underground comics, I started doing this um, strip called The Adventures of Down and Out Dog. And it was a character, I, I started this in the, in Ra Ronald Reagan was president uh, when I started doing this strip. And it was um, a way for me just every day, you know, th there wasn't any sense that these strips would ever see the light of day, although I did collect them as a book. And uh, this was another big moment. Um, I borrowed money from my parents to print a book, and I was able to pay them back, like, right away. It sold very well. And they thought, okay, we'll, we'll get off his ass for a little while about getting a real job. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's hard bringing up good parents, but if you're patient with them, they, they come around eventually. So I, I did this strip, and this is where I really cut my teeth and built an audience, and, and whatever influences or things I was reading, I could incorporate in the work. Um, and it was a very exciting time. It gave me a lot of confidence, you know, like, like um, Michigan State. It's this huge, uh, you know, huge student body, and, and uh, I had an audience. And uh, that, was, that, was really, that was really exciting for me. Now, People are probably familiar with The Onion, but these are like some of the very first issues. Never mind the volume 14, number five. I think that was like the second issue. Uh, but a, a couple of my friends um, started The Onion and they asked me to help out. Uh, they reprinted some of the old dog comics because they were so popular in Daily Cardinal that they, they had a vintage dog section. And uh, I started contributing to The Onion. And uh, what, what happened, even though Down and Out Dog was this kind of uh, humorous, uh, underground inspired comic, it, it, it's, it, it went from a gag to kind of like this kind of um, adventure strip. And I started realizing that the format, um, I wanted to tell bigger, broader stories. And uh, when The Onion invited me to do whatever I wanted, I started, uh, I submitted this idea 
to do a comic about breakfast cereal characters. And it was a, I got a whole page instead of a strip, and I did it for almost a year, the very first year of The Onion, and it, 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 was, it didn't work out very well. And I soon realized, huh, um, this isn't the right format either, one, one page a week. Uh, so from there I started uh, working on, I guess, what was my, my first graphic novel, which was this uh, series called The Serial Killings, which was about breakfast serial characters who started passing away. And I was inspired uh, from reading Wendell Berry and thinking about the relationship between culture and agriculture. He had a, a book called The Unsettling of America, which I rec still recommend. And also I started eating, I was on a macrobiotic diet for several years, and as these, uh, in, in this relationship between popular culture and, and food, uh, where, where, where food was now here to entertain us, not to provide um, nutrition. <laughs> so this was this, this attempt to, to make an early graphic novel. And cartoonists are nothing if they're not dogged. I was able to do, you know, finish the story. Um, I, the, the, the idea of reprinting it sends chills down my spine. Um, so after, uh, I, I, as I was working, I should say, on the serial killings, um, I got the first issue done in Fanographics Books out of Seattle offered to start publishing my work. And at the same time, uh, Tim Keck, who was one of the founders of The Onion, he had left early on and said, I'm starting a newspaper out in Seattle, and would you like to help me start it? So between Fanographics and The Stranger, I moved to Seattle in around 1991, and I became the, the paper's first art director. Uh, that image on the left of the, of the guy in a straight jacket is um, Jason Lutz, who I now teach with at the Center for Cartoon Studies and a great cartoonist in his own right. Um, and uh, it was this irreverent um, newspaper where anything went. Uh, in the years since, it's actually won a Pulitzer Prize um, for reporting. So it's matured like uh, the rest of us. Seattle was this time, uh, when I was there, it was booming. Everybody seemed to be moving there. Uh, people who are English majors are becoming millionaires, <laughs> uh, working for Microsoft and, and other startups. And uh, there was this sense that anything you know, was possible. And around this time, I um, started moving from, uh, I, I finished the serial killings, and I, I wasn't happy with the way it, it turned out. And I thought, well, I'm going to start working on some shorter stories where I have a chance to kind of get in and get out. And the Revival um, was a story that took place in 1801 about a, at, a, at the Cane Ridge um, Revival in Ohio, which was then a frontier. And it was uh, an exploration of what was possible. What are the limits and possibilities of faith? Um, at this time, I was uh, also seeing a psychic healer who was like, able to s say things and tell me things that belied any kind of logic or reason. Um, and the whole, the whole scene of actually the, the, the revival, the, the comic, um, when I, the more I read about it, the more it seems, this, this feels like a Grateful Dead parking lot where a lot of people are tripping on acid. Uh, so I, I, I tried to bring some, um, you know, what I know into this historical context. Uh, the second story was um, hundreds of feet below daylight. Uh, in the revival, everybody's looking up for salvation, and hundreds of feet below daylight, everybody is kind of digging down into the earth for the kind of profane pursuit of material wealth. Uh, so with these stories, I was really cutting my teeth and, and developing my chops and learning, learning how to tell, tell hopefully a good story. And this kind of trilogy of American stories culminated in a book called The Golem's Mighty Swing. Uh, it was about a barnstorming team of Jewish baseball players in the 1920s. And I love baseball. I'm a Met fan. Got high <laughs> hopes this year. And it just seemed like a very neat metaphor, right? Like every year Jews get together for Passover and they say, next year in Jerusalem, next year we will return home. In baseball, the whole idea is to return home. You step up to home plate, that looks like a little house. And the idea is to travel around the bases and, and return home. And it's very interesting with th this book, uh, it, it's actually being re-released uh, this spring, a new edition. And uh, so I, I reread it and, and uh, you know, in preparation for it, uh, for the release. 
And I, I was just amazed how um, scarily uh, it seems to speak to this moment. Uh, it really is the anatomy of a race riot. It talks about the way that the media can amplify stereotypes. There's a character named Victor Page who, who's only concerned about winning the headline, so to speak. And um, yeah, it, it's uh, it, all the things I thought the book was about um, when I did it, um, more of an exploration of my own Jewish identity. Um, it seems uh, unfortunately very fitting for this, for this political moment as well. The thing I like about being a cartoonist as well that I can become an amateur historian, philosopher, um, I'm a cinematographer, uh, I'm a designer, I'm a writer. There's a lot of hats, a lot of skill sets one brings to cartooning. Uh, these are just some of the influences that went into the making of the Golem Mighty Swing, old baseball photography. I love looking at those old faces of baseball players. Uh, and look at that, there's a Detroit player. I didn't even put that, I, I wasn't even um, trying to win this crowd over, but there he is. Uh, you know, these, these, these were oftentimes first generation Americans. Uh, they weren't the pampered athletes of today. They sold shoes, um, were on the road, uh, trying to make a living during the off season. Uh, I grew up, as I said, on Marvel Comics, the Golem. Uh, there was a Golem comic, and also the Hulk, you could argue, is a type of Golem. And then the 1920s uh, film, Der Golem, as well, plays a prominent role. And it's kind of collecting all these different things uh, and trying to make a um, kind of a, a story that brings them all together to make sense of all these disparate elements. And you know, when I thank comics, I think this is the thing I thank comics for, that to take all these different thi opposing forces and things that seem contradictory, um, things that one can, you know, different things that can overwhelm you and then try to kind of braid it into kind of a, a single narrative and make sense of the world. The other big influence in, 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 in Golem's Mighty Swing, uh, one of the pages I drew and one of the pages is a Japanese manga. I'm sure you can tell the difference. And uh, studying Japanese manga was like a master's class in cartooning. Uh, there is so much information embedded in every page. And although I don't read or speak Japanese, uh, these Japanese manga that I was able to get my hands on, uh, I was able to follow a baseball team over several uh, seasons, uh, get to know the characters, understand the drama, just by how much information they embedded you know, this page, there's a, 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 a pitcher who's throwing a fastball, or, or appears to be throwing a fastball, and then the ball seems to suddenly stop on the page, and the hitter's fooled, and he lunges at the off-speed pitch and barely, you know, nubs out a little shot. Um, and if you know baseball, like, it's all there embedded, and that's, uh, that's an amazing trick to be able to do on a comics page. So. With this, uh, I guess the, 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 the Golem's Mighty Swing in some ways um, put me on the map outside of Madison, Wisconsin. And uh, I was um, trying to find a job. I had taught at a, at a college for four years. And uh, I was trying to figure out what, what to do. And I, I just had my first daughter. And I was living in Vermont for temporarily. And I thought about um, starting a cartoon school. And uh, this is a, a drawing by a friend of mine, a wonderful cartoonist, Seth, um, that I actually used to try to procure funds from um, the, the State House in Vermont to fix up an old department store and open a cartoon school. Um, and I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to intersperse uh, this talk with some of the reading of my comics, so I'm just not talking about them. I can actually read some comics. So around the same time, and uh, this is about 2001, I also um, did this comic, and, and, and there's a, 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 someone in it who starts a school. I think um, there the similarities end, I hope, but you'll, you'll see what I mean in a second. So without further ado, The Vast Chasm, an abbreviated biography of August Isaacson, 1696 to 1788. Isaac Isaacson was an 18th century Swedish physician and scientist of little distinction or rank. Despite the advantages of being born into a family of wealth and rank, I have accomplished little to distinguish myself in my professional endeavors. The parents, 
Jesper and Ulrika, they don't look too happy with him. But in the year of 1768, at 72 years of age, Isaacson began hearing music inside his head. These heavenly melodies, these spells of grace, how blessed to hear the Lord's song, to travel between his realms. These spells would last minutes, hours, or longer. Upon awakening from my most recent journey, two entire, two entire days are unaccounted for. Isaacson's colleagues believed he was falling victim to dementia and senility and asked him to resign his post. Isaacson refused. Were he not an aristocrat, he might have been institutionalized. To step down would validate those naysayers who questioned the authenticity of my experience. In an attempt to prove his detractors wrong, Isaacson turned to Sweden's leading composers to help him write his celestial symphony. He was resoundingly refused and subjected to even more public ridicule. I know thy name, name Job. God chooses a musical dolt to bring his song into this earthly realm. Am I mocked from above as I am from below? Despite his troubles, the music Isaacson heard did not relent, nor his desire to share it with the world. He returned to his original vocation, science. Since God chose a scientist and not a composer, it must be a scientist who is the pilgrim that unlocks heaven's gates. In the 18th century, it was a widely held notion that the soul was an undiscovered organ residing in the human body. And this organ must reside in the ear, for it is music, above all else, that transports the soul. At the age of 74, Isaacson began a fervid anatomical probe with the most ambitious of goals, to open a conduit between worlds so all may travel freely, thus heaven and earth reunited as it were before the fall. Isaacson, using all of his financial resources, founded the Academy of Surgery and Dissection. May this noble institution establish a beachhead on heaven's shores. For the next two decades, Isaacson worked with undiminished energy and passion. Never before had the anatomical structure of the inner ear been so thoroughly and precisely identified. The spiraling cochlea reflects in structure Jacob's ladder. A reflection of form indicates a reflection of function. Isaacson correctly attributed the semicircular canal as the body's center for equilibrium and balance. He began publishing his findings in 1778. The European scientific community flocked to the academy as it became the center for anatomical research. We have identified only a tiny toenail of a giant unseen beast. Even Isaacson's most ardent critics were astonished by his accomplishments. His findings were decades ahead of his contemporaries. And still, the most central mystery remains. At, at 92 years of age, failing eyesight forced Isaacson to seize his work. The sweet fruit of knowledge I shall no longer taste, only the salty brine as I drown in an ocean of my own ignorance. Instead of taking satisfaction in unprecedented accomplishments, Isaacson died believing himself a failure. And how shall I be judged? Given holy seed, I leave a fallow field. Isaacson took his own life on March 27, 1788. Perhaps after all, it was not the Lord's music which I heard, but the devil's. Filling my head as I writhed in the vast ch chasm between what I set out to do and what, I am, and what I am capable of. The end. Every time I read this, I, I, I <laughs> there's uh, something else that kind of uh, grabs my attention or speaks to me. Um, this is very, very loosely based on the life of Emanuel Swedenborg. Uh, who, who at a very old, who was an aristocrat and at a very, very old age had visions. Have, have anybody ever heard of Emanuel Swedenborg? A few of you, yeah. His, his disciples, uh, well, well he, 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 he did all this writing based on his visions and uh, 
that became the, the um, after he died, the center, um, the Church of the New Jerusalem was founded, and people like William Blake and Helen Keller and Johnny Appleseed uh, were, were all members and, of, of, of said church. Um, anyway, that's that. And I did go on and start a school, so <laughs> there you go. Um, and and uh, I don't think I will, I will I, I, I'm not in danger of taking my own life, but I, I do, I do, you know, if you're in the arts, right, like, I think everybody knows this, who, who's attempted to make art, whether it's music or a painting, you have a, a vision in your head of what you want it to be, and then you're able to create something which is so far from, from what you imagined, and um, that's, that's that vast chasm. And I guess, the, ultimately, um, the trick, if it's a trick, is, is to kind of, yes, accept uh, that there's this platonic idea of what you want to do, and then there's what you can actually do. And um, accepting the fact that, that whatever resources you have at your disposal, resources of time, of talent, um, those are the appropriate resources for that moment. So um, I started a school, um, and every school needs a textbook. And uh, this was my first textbook when I started teaching classes at Emberley's Drawing Book. Uh, I read his animal book when I was a kid and loved it. The thing I love about comics, uh, especially like Peanuts and Ed Emberley, um, on one hand, they're these little abstract cacophony of shapes and squiggles, and you see them as an abstraction. And then at the exact same time, you see them as these personalities, and, and maybe with a soul, if you're Charles, Charles Schultz drawing, but they have character, and, and, and they're alive on the page. And to be able to be both an abstraction and this kind of living thing that has a life of its own, a golem, if you will, um, that still blows my mind um, and, and creates all sorts of wonderment. And in, in this book, um, he shows you how to just kind of basically make simple animals, and uh, uh, vehicles, and buildings. And one of the things that, that I think about when I, um, when I think about comics, which is always, <laughs> I think that comics, you know, they, people think that it's a kind of, uh, it's, it's writing and drawing, right? It's, it's, it, 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 it's writing and illustration. And I really think of it more as design and poetry. You're boiling down language. There's only so much room you can put it on a page. You have to arrange it just so on a page. Um, and with, with the imagery, you have to communicate. You know? um, not that comics can't be illustrative. Of course they can be. Uh, but first and for foremost, I believe they have to, um, you, have to, you have to illustrate. And just in the same way that, that, that our um, August Isaacson uh, was a little uh, insecure, uh, I think a lot of cartoonists are as well, or a lot of people in the arts. And uh, what, what this assignment did, uh, it, it took the drawing out of the equation. So I, I would ask students to make comics based on this visual vocabulary. So you start thinking like, a, you're not just thinking like, I have to illustrate something, you're thinking about storytelling, cuts and edits, and, and, um, and, and what you actually want to say, not, not, not how you're going to render it. Uh, from, from, these, from this assignment, what was great, like uh, two of the very first, uh, two members of the very first class of the Center for Cartoon Studies in 2005, Andrew Arnold and Alexis Frederick Frost, um, I, started, I collaborated with them on a, on, a, on a series of books called Adventures in Cartooning. And uh, I won't read that, I'll just allow you to read that. Um, and basically what I was trying to do is take Ed Emberley, which teaches you how to construct simple figures, and then how do you take those simple figures and then put them in a story? So I wanted to combine Ed Emberley and kind of like um, Scott McCloud's Understanding Comics. And I think because my kids maybe went to a Waldorf school, I wanted to do it with, a, with narrative, you know? And, uh, and do it, tell a really great story, um, or is the best story I could tell. So, you know, here's a little sequence where, where there's this cartooning elf who's so excited about sharing comics uh, and then you know, that now with panels, you can see how panels are like a, a, a discrete moment of time on a page. 
and they go on all sorts of adventures, uh, and all, all along the way, the, 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 the knight just wants to have an adventure, the elf wants to um, teach comics, much to the knight's chagrin. And these are just some of the sequences where, you know, like, like maybe the water of education, you, you embed a lot of the lessons just in the storytelling, and then you, you mention them and can unpack them at some point. Uh, but, you know, talking about panel progressions, aspect to aspect storytelling, it was a well of a good book. <laughs> You're horrible. That was like the worst love hanging fruit. I love you all. <laughs> okay. Why we're on the subject of children's books? Um, well, these are some of the adventures and cartooning books uh, that, that we've done over the years. Um, you know, I came from a, a background of kind of being an auteur. Charles Schultz and Robert Crumb, um, you know, were two of my heroes. Um, Spiegelman, I mentioned. Uh, and, uh, you know, the work that, uh, my, my adult graphic novels, I, I write and draw myself for the most part. Uh, but I love collaborating as well, and these have been a real, um, a real treat to work with other people. Uh, and then talking about children's books, just this last year, I, um, coming full circle, when I was interning at Raw Magazine, uh, which is run by Art Spiegelman and his wife, Francoise Moulet. Francoise just started, an, uh, not just, I think it's like 10 years old now almost, um, she started an imprint called Toon, uh, which is comics, um, helping teach visual literacy, literacy, and I did a couple books, uh, one Ape and Armadillo, here's a little sample of that, uh, one character who's very imaginative and wants to control the play um, and has to kind of figure out, do I go for excellence or do I go for community and try to um, and, you know, keep a friendship even if my story isn't as awesome. Um, and these are some examples of, of some kids' books I've done. He kind of scares the bejesus out of Ape. Uh, so, so many of my projects are born out of avoiding other things, you know? And I was working on a project that wasn't happening for way too long. And I, when I sat down, I was like, okay, just let's make some stuff, have fun. And I wrote like three or four children's books this, this summer, uh, one of them being Ape and Armadillo. And when Francoise wanted to publish it, it was the wrong size for her books. And there was like this gap underneath every page. So, you know, we could put a little graphic design or make the page numbers bigger, but I, I just made these little tiny strips that would go underneath every, every page. And it became the, my favorite part of the book. Uh, this little kind of little narrative where, um, you know, you could just kind of explore the characters, you can ask them silly questions. It felt like a little, like doing improv comedy. Uh, it took me back to my roots of that down and out doll character where you're just making stuff up every day. Sometimes when you're doing longer graphic novels and you're writing uh, a draft and then another draft and then you're drawing it and it's like a three, four, five, you know, four year project, I guess is the longest that the Golden's Mighty Swing took me on a project, although something I'm working on now has been just as long. Um, it's really fun to just create something on the spot. Uh, and I'm trying to get back to that now in my own work, which I'll be talking about in a little bit. Um, this is another book. Uh, when I was burning out with making books um, and struggling with some of the, uh, the publishing houses in, in NYC um, and beyond, uh, a friend of mine was studying this Japanese tradition of kamishibai, uh, which is um, a performance where, 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 where a kamishibai man, it was often men, he would ride their, his bicycle into different villages and neighborhood, and on the front of his bike, uh, do I have a page of that? Uh, no. Uh, on the front of his bike was a wooden box. Uh, and he, he would get into town and he would bang sticks together like a good humor man would, would ring a bell. And all the kids would run out. And on the back of his bike, he'd have a concession stand, basically. And if you bought candy, you could stand up front. And then he would open the box and there'd be these cards, these like uh, 11 by 16 cards. And they, they're, they're all stacked in this frame and he would pull them out one by one as he told this uh, story. And often they were cliffhangers, they were superheroes before even superheroes were, um, you know, before Superman ever came out in the 30s here. Uh, and it was this tradition that, that television eventually um, 
destroyed. In fact, the Japanese word for television, I think, was originally electric kamishibai. So I uh, did a series of, uh, so when my friend told me about this, this seemed like so much fun, again, to collaborate, get out of my own head with these projects I was struggling with. And I created a series of just images that he told a story with when he performed it. And then uh, Francoise was like, this is a book. It is? So it's a book of images that has a little bit about the history of Kamishiba at the end, but then there's just blank pages and everybody has to bring their own narrative to it. And this is a, an image from that uh, little folk tale about two children uh, that are cruel to animals and get turned into monkeys by a mountain wizard and have to learn about empathy, hopefully. Um, this is a graphic novel that came out in, I think, 2007 or 8, and um, I'll take a little bit of a closer look in this just to share my process a little bit. And it's called Market Day. It's kind of continuing this historic fiction that I did. It takes place around the turn of the century. And it's basically a story that takes place over the course of one day. Um, although I don't have slot, you know, I, I can show influences like Crum and Spiegelman and whatnot. And, um, but a lot of my influences, too, are, are writers. Uh, I've loved Richard Ford, Independence Day, and the sports writer. And uh, I, these stories that take place over the course of like one day, you know, the moviegoer um, by Percy, and, uh, and, and even, even Salinger's uh, A Catcher in the Rye. It's, like, it's all self-contained. Even the Fantastic Four comic I did took place over the course of one weekend. So this is a day where, where, where a character who is, is actually quite blessed up until this day, where his calling and his career are one and the same. And, uh, and on this day, um, those things start to go in opposite directions. And uh, he has a, you know, kind of a, a, a crisis. And color was really important. Uh, I, I drew the book in black and white. And when I colored it, I wanted to tell a story just using color. Um, you know, not only reflecting his moods, but reflecting kind of, um, you know, the, the beginning, middle, end of, of, of a single day. Here he is walking, taking this long walk with his uh, mule and his carpets um, to the market. And color, I love, this is one of the, 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 the parts of the process of cartooning I think I love most is like just kind of doodling and creating in the beginning and then kind of coloring at the end uh, and, and kind of fidgeting, trying to get that palette just right. Um, and, and it really seems to make the, the drawings come alive in a way. And uh, it's a story of a weaver. Um, in a way, the weaver is, again, I think everything, every, every, everything I do is almost like a stand-in for a cartoonist or um, some kind of emotional um, autobiography in some sense. So these are just some of the photos that inspired uh, old uh, Yiddish postcards. There was also, a, um, you know, th these, are, these are images of a world, um, uh, of a culture that was really ob obliterated uh, during World War II. And there was also an impulse on my part to kind of re-inhabit this world and, and make it feel alive again. Um, and not just like in this huge historical scope, but on a very personal level and to connect with that world. So my source materials yeah, were, were photographs and, uh, and drawings. Um, and I would take drawings like that, and, 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 I'm, and I would just sketch on copy paper, and then eventually do a line drawing, scan it into a computer, and then, and then color on the, on the computer. And I'm, I'm covering kind of a, a big arc of my career, so I think there's going to be some time for questions and answers as well. Um, so if there's any questions about any, anything, um, I will encourage you to ask. These were drawings by this guy Jacob Rice, uh, Reese, uh, in 1922. And I would take his drawings and kind of redraw it, again, just with a number two pencil on copy paper, and then kind of simplify it. Um, you know, I, I, I use value to kind of figure out my, my palette in some ways. 
Um, and then also this this was a this was a a road in Vermont, <laughs> which felt like it could belong in Eastern Europe as well. All right, time for another comic. This is a comic I did, uh, I want to say, three years ago, called The Sponsor. Um, I think it also, like Market Day, where it kind of deals with one's calling and one's career, uh, this story also, I think, um, Similar theme in its own way. Honey, I have to go. At this hour, Casey's in trouble. <laughs> hey, I got here as fast as I could. I'm so fucking sorry, Alan. I'm such an asshole to bother you. Jesus, what was I thinking? Bullshit! I'm here for you, Casey. I know what it's like. I've been there. Now tell me what's going on. I went to Tessa's signing at Rocket Ship tonight. It was packed, lines out the door. She's that 21-year-old you told me about, the one profiled in the Times? Yup. Listen to me, Casey. Don't compare yourself to anyone else. What you do and what Tessa does are, she's three years younger than me and D&Q is publishing her next book. <laughs> Screw that, what do we always talk about? Keep your eyes on your own drawing board. One panel at a time. I've been posting new pages twice a week for a year, and except for the day Scott McCloud linked to my site, I've had like no traffic. You're a good cartoonist, Casey. This online crap is just a distraction. Good. Can you imagine Crumb worrying about how many hits he got? It's absurd. Raising $350,000 on Kickstarter is not absurd. $350,000? She did it in three days. Whoa, let's not go there, Casey. Not a good place. Damn. I'm sorry I bothered you, Alan. I need to work. I need to work some stuff out. I'm thinking about grad school. Good night, Alan. Thanks for everything. Stay strong, brother. <coughs> Hello, Ron. Sorry to call so late, but I need to talk to someone. <laughs> yeah, I, this could have been called uh, to compare is to despair <laughs> as well. Uh, this was published online, and it actually, at the time, it created a little bit of a kerfuffle uh, for, for reasons, um, I think, um, which still um, befuddle me, but uh, it was, a, it, was a interesting, um, it was interesting getting such a strong response. I felt like I was back at the University of Wisconsin with my dad on that dog's trip again. Um, okay, so I'm going to um, start heading into my, uh, my descent here, um, and th I'm going to share with you some current work that I'm working on. So I, I talked about trying to do comics that feel a little more alive. Um, I, was, I was trying to work on something through many drafts and it just started feeling dead. So um, about a year ago, I was avoiding another project and I just started doing these uh, little comics. And actually I would put them in these little four by six um, photo albums on cards. And I just started building one, one, one little book at a time. And they started coming together and uh, I said it, it, it actually takes place this past fall through the election season. Um, and it, ends, it, ends, it ended just this past Christmas. So that, 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 that's, that's how the, the duration of this narrative. And uh, I serialized some of them on Slate and I'm, I'm drawing some more for a, a book that's coming out. And it really helped me get through the fall, to be honest with you. Um, and it's actually, uh, I won't go into <laughs> all the different strands that inform the work, but uh, long story short, it's uh, the story of a newly separated uh, dad. He's got two young kids, and um, he's trying to uh, make a living. It sounds familiar based, based on my work. Um, and, and raise two young kids and kind of keep it together in, in, these, in these trying times. Uh, so uh, the story kind of, you know, takes note of, 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 of the election season, of, of the holidays, 
And uh, this, is, this is actually you'll see, is, 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 is my Halloween story, but um, it, it talks about the, 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 the history of, um, of the main character and his, and his spouse. Closing night. I was backstage as the cast did a final Q&A following their final performance. Can everybody read that? I'm going to let you read the word balloons and I'll, uh, I'll just read the captions. How's that? I suddenly noticed Lisa standing next to me and can no longer focus on anything else. The summer theater on the Cape was on an old army base. Lisa did everything from making costumes to passing out flyers on Commercial Street. I helped build the set. I had a huge crush on her. A five year age difference is nothing now, but at that time, but at that age, it was enough for me to keep my distance. I think we exchanged 10 words all summer. Lisa had just gra graduated from high school and I was, head and was heading to Brown. I had just finished college at Keene State and had no idea what I was doing. Lisa shifted her weight and her arms touched. A jolt of electricity surged through my body. I was painfully aware of the summer slipping away and how desperately I wanted to have something happen. But anything I could think of sounded so cheap and ridiculous. It was Lisa who seized the moment. We wandered out of the theater and onto the dunes. Lisa insisted we wear the paper mache masks. Lisa told me she had dropped acid earlier in the evening. I was crestfallen. So this was why Lisa was suddenly interested in me? Lisa had another tab and invited me to join her. I had never tripped before. We left behind our masks and wandered the dunes. At some point, one of us said we had no idea where we were, and this struck us as the funniest thing we had ever heard. My heartbeat indistinguishable from the far off waves, Lisa right there with me, understanding it all perfectly. We followed the sound of the water to a low tide. The sunrise was a revelation. Lisa and I together, impossible, inevitable. We were inseparable for Lisa's three remaining days. When Lisa's parents arrived to pick her up, they barely acknowledged my existence. Lisa and I made no promises to each other. We didn't have to. Then six years of girlfriends and boyfriends, friending and unfriending, relocations, long absences, and uncertain reunions. Despite what we thought at the time, the marriage was less a bold act than an end to an exhausting courtship. Soon after, the kids arrived. Both Lisa and I insisted on taking them trick-or-treating. So for this one night, we are all together as a family. A month ago, I couldn't have done this. Maybe not even now, if the evening wasn't already so surreal. So no eruptions tonight, only disbelief. Lisa and I are estranged. Um, I'm going to read the title story of, the, of this uh, series. The, and uh, that will be the next one. Off season. It was my weekend with the kids and we drove out to the main coast. The November wind was pretty cold and no one was dressed warm enough. Before the divorce, the family came here every August. We'd all pile into one hotel room. Inevitably, one of the kids couldn't sleep, so neither would anyone else. There would be the annual fight too. Lisa wanting to eat out, me insisting on making sandwiches. 
Maybe I should have checked the weather or realized there's a reason no one goes to the coast in November. We aren't at the beach an hour when we head into town in search of hot chocolate. The place is like a ghost town. We pass the gallery where Lisa and I, before kids, bought a painting together. I'd never bought art before, and I remember thinking to myself, I'm now a guy who buys art. I genuinely liked the painting. Lisa liked it because it was kitschy. All the little cafes are closed, so that leaves the convenience store. Kids don't know the difference. Maybe two people liking something for different reasons is only a fight that hasn't happened yet. It's only 2.30, but it feels much later. We do get gum and chips and trail mix and take off before we even check into the hotel. We sold the painting at the garage sale. Lisa didn't want it, so I wasn't going to want it either. For me, the beach, even on a shitty day, is still the beach. I'll bring the kids back when the weather is warmer and everything is open. I'll also find out then if I'm still the type of guy who buys art. All right. Um, one final story. Um, this is something that uh, hasn't been published. Uh, and we'll end there. The question of the poet. After 30 minutes of reading, the poet asks, should I keep going? Is he oblivious to our furtive glances at our cell phones, the foot tapping and clipped coughs? Yet someone in the crowd, out of sympathy or obligation, reassures the poet, please go on. I am convinced the majority of us did not want him to go on, the silent majority. And now, we are all trapped for who knows how long. And so he goes on, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, abusing our goodwill. The babysitter's meter is running. An older couple, increasingly anxious to drive at night, think about their ride home. Folding chairs that are not doing our backs any favors. <laughs> he is finished, and there is polite, relieved applause. A few s copies of his book are signed and sold as the lone bookstore employee waits to close shop and begin her own night of entertainment. We return to our lives and routines while the poet shuffles off for a late dinner with his partner. His question still lingers. Should I go on? Should I do another one? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, James. No, go on. <laughs> Are there any questions James? Yeah. Uh, hello, my name is Dion Howard, and my question is, um, I see uh, you've done a lot of different things in comics. You create your own comics. You work with other uh, publications, studios, and you also publish your own books in addition to you know, being a star and having your own school. So my question is, you know, between all those different roles and responsibilities, how is it that you're you know, still able to produce work without getting burnt out? I used to have a lot of hair. <laughs> I'm actually only 30, but I look like this. Uh, no, um, I, I, I do get a little burnt out. Um, I do get a little burnt out. And uh, what I've learned with, with, with my comics, that I think of my comics, um, and even though, like, yeah, I make books and there's a commercial aspect to it, um, I think of my comics as a practice. like. Um, 
you know, meditation or yoga or Tai Chi or whatever it is. And uh, I have to do that practice regularly. And if too much time goes that I'm not doing it, I, I, I have a hard time living with myself. Um, and then, you know, that's a really great question, like, about, about burnout, because um, it's really easy to get burned out, you know. Um, I mean, just, just following current events can, can, can make one feel traumatized some days. Um, and I do think uh, recognizing that comics to me is that, and not thinking of it as just this purely uh, commercial uh, venture really helps. Um, and then uh, I try to go on, like, a, the last few years, I, I try to go on, a, on a, a residency, some kind of art retreat where there are places where you can go for like a month or a week or two weeks, depending on one's other obligations, where you go and they feed you and they give you a, a room and you just make artwork. And that's very, very restorative. Um, this January, I signed up for the 30 days, $30 unlimited Bikram yoga classes. That was, that was very helpful, too. I'd never done, <laughs> just like that guy, like, now I'm a guy who buys art. Like, I'm a guy who did yoga. And, uh, and that, that, that helps, trying to find some kind of balance. I, I, I work with um, enough students, and I see how out of balance their lives can get because they're just all in with the art. And it's amazing how um, if, if, you're, if you're running the marathon and not the sprint, uh, you know, learning to eat well, exercising, um, having so a few interests outside of um, you know, your core passion uh, goes a long way to kind of keeping keep, keeping you solid. It's a great question. You've learned a lot about creating comics. You've taught a lot about creating comics. What's one of the most unexpected things you've learned? Um, so one of the things we have at the cartoon school is a, a weekly visiting artist. Every week Somebody comes in, the whole school gets together, and we've had people, you know, who do strips and who do political cartoons and graphic novels and YA, I mean, the whole gambit. And they talk about their process. I would say the one thing, like, that I learned, um, the most important thing is there's no right way to do it. There's only your way. Everybody came to it a different way, and everybody's process isn't something you arrive at. It's this evolving thing as well. And I think, uh, you know, when, when you're in that vast chasm that I talked about earlier of like, you know, like what you're trying to do and this gap between what you're set out to do and, and what, you're, what you actually are able to accomplish, there's a, a lot of reasons people stop making art. And I, I think one of the reasons people stop, and I think it's so essential to be making art because it does, it, it, it helps you connect to the world in a way and helps make sense of the world. And when you stop, you, you lose something very fundamental. And I think this is something that's also embedded in that book, Market Day, as well. Um, I, I think people stop because they don't think they're doing it the right way. You know, they're, they're comparing, they're despairing. And I'm, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know, if I just found the right nib or the right pen or the right computer program, it would all come together. And, and the fact of the matter is, if you think about it as a practice and you, you just say, okay, whatever resources I have of talent, of time, and I bring that you know, whatever I can. Some, some days it might be 10 minutes, some days it might be 10 hours. Uh, things work out. Um, but I, I would think that, that that's the big thing. Is that there's, there's just absolutely no, no right way to do it except just showing up and, and doing it um, consistently. And, and, and that will ebb and flow, how much you can bring to it given other obligations. Um, but that would be it, I think, yeah. Yeah, that's another, ah, good questions. Um, yeah, like trying to do something in the spirit of good enough, right? Like letting something go. Deadlines help. <laughs> you know, kind of painting yourself into a corner. Um, I'm somebody, uh, I, I have fussed over things to the nth degree. Um, and I've seen, it, I, I've seen the paralyzing influence, I've seen the paralyzing effect of that 
uh, and the toxic effect on that. Uh, with s there's a certain type of student that I've had regularly ever since I started teaching that they're, they're actually very talented and very smart and they can make a, a, a beautiful image, but like everything has to be perfect. And um, I don't know, they say good is the enemy of great, but maybe like greatness is the enemy of just like sanity, you know? Um, I, I, I feel like I, it, it's such a, at least in the students that I've worked with over the years with it, um, you know, I've, I've tried to have little tricks or, or deadlines or do this, do that, but it's, it's a pathology that's, um, that, 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 that's really, that's really dif difficult. And I, I think having just, um, you know, when, going back to this idea of a practice, like saying, I'm, I'm going to do four panels a day, you know, having a sketchbook where, where you know, to a certain extent, it almost feels like stage fright, right? Like you go on and you have to like get it all perfect. And, um, but, but if you are, um, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're practicing every day, it doesn't feel as tight. So like doing a diary comic, four panels every day, or uh, I keep sketchbooks and, you know, I'll just have different themes for a sketchbook. And um, especially when I'm in longer projects, I want that satisfaction of doing a finished just a finished drawing, it could be anything. So I'll do like, oh, I'll fill a sketchbook with a little gag comic every day. And no matter, even if it's late at night, um, I have to do one. So it could be, could be really bad. And I guess challenging yourself to like do something really mediocre. And I think if you do that every day, it's kind of like this yoga stuff I'm doing. They're just like, congratulations, you showed up. You know, like, <laughs> you know, like I didn't pass out in that room the first like few days. Like, that's a win, you know? Like, I, 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 I walked into that room. That was a win, you know? And then over the course of, you know, the, the you know, I don't know, I did it like 12 times in my, my 30 days. It's like by the end of the 12 days, it's like I wasn't going to pass out. And I almost could touch my toes. It, I almost, but um, so I, I think just dedicating yourself to practice and not expecting the result, right? I mean, but it's, it's, it's easier said than done, right? Thank you. Questions. One is just curiosity. In the original law, which I have a couple of copies of that I used to show students, but now I don't because they're breaking. <laughs> um, how did they pick the artwork? Was, was it submitted or did they go out and find the artists? I think both. Um, I think basically Francoise and uh, Art were the, the you know, edit editorial team. I know there were some associate editors, but I really, I don't really know like how much curation they did. Um, but I think some people, you know, rolled onto their doorstep, and I think they also had a, a, a mission to like grab some international artists and bring them into the mix. Some there was one issue where they paired artists and writers in, in surprising ways. Um, there was historical figures that they reprinted, so it, it was it was kind of a, a heady heady mix there. Second question is, um, God, your drawing is so gorgeous, and it varies quite a bit. I mean, what, some of it looks like Durer, some of it looks a well, bit like Well, <laughs> go on. <laughs> Do you have a third question, though? No. Yes. Well, then, almost okay, every yeah, or, yeah, yeah. Well, as, as often, possibly, yeah, possibly right. Um, and then you um, decide what the narrative is going to be, and then you create more drawings that yeah. go with the quote unquote style. Yeah, well, you know, again, like when, when I'm drawing like a little gag comic a day, it's going to be looser. Um, these, uh, you know, these, this story uh, is a little bit, um, a little bit looser. Um, you know, really, I, I think each story kind of 
asks something of you. Um, and you, you, one evolves too, like, you know, like how I letter is very different now than how I used to letter. Um, you know, this I'm actually drawing and then using a, a Payne's gray wash over it. Um, Oh. Turner. Does that make you feel good? Oh. <laughs> like Turner? Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, I, I'm trying to wear it a little more loosely and not be as tight. And, um, you know, it, but I still fuss. Like, I'll, I'll, it's a pro, like, you know, I do these on little pieces of watercolor paper. You know, I'll, I'll, you know, like, you know, something like this. I find photo reference or, or that. You know, I went to the local store and took a photo. And then might trace some of it, or draw it, and redraw it, and then light box it, and then you know, then pen and ink, and then do a wash, and then scan it in, and then once it's scanned it in, I, I have these like Kyle Webster Photoshop brushes, and just kind of like build a little more contrast or darken a few things, and you know, and then um, you know, so I, I I I want it to look effortless, or or at least you know. I don't want to bring too much attention to the artwork in, in its own way. I just want it to feel like, oh yeah, there it is. Um, but but you know, I, there are some panels I sweat over more more you know more than others. But you know, you don't want the the effort to show in a way, right? Oh well, thank you. Hi. Um, Hello. Yeah. How do I find motivation? Well, I think you got to kind of trick yourself. Like, like one of the things that 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 um, that I do is is uh, I'll go to you know a dollar store or a Walmart and I'll buy these like you know that that, that last story I read. Um, I, you know, I get like blank index cards, eleven, you know, a four by six, and you know you can only you know so maybe you just do one little drawing about a character and you kind of just stick it right in there, and then you know you look at it the next day you draw the next panel. And then you know maybe oh yeah, I'll draw the next panel and just stick it in there, and uh, and if you just do a little thing every day, suddenly these panels start talking to each other, and, and you get excited by it, and you're like oh I could move this around, or maybe I'll redraw this one, and, and then you just start playing with it a little bit, and the next thing you know you have, you know you're 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 having fun again. Um, I think I think that I think again you know trying just to to take the the pressure off that you're gonna. Publish it or do something, you know, amazing with it, whatever. You just, you know, just try to. If I can, you know, for me, it's a tool to, to keep my, my sanity um, as well. The the other thing that I did, uh, there's another cartoonist I work with named Alec Longstreth, and um, we designed a a little seven day course where 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 you can subscribe to it, and every day you get a little challenge, and you get like tips and inspiration and fun facts. And, uh, and, and it's called like the one week work cartoon workout. And it's at the Cartoon Studies website. And you just, it's free, you just give it the email and then every day you get an email. And you don't have to do it every day, you could get them all in your box for a week and then just take your time. But it just, you know, like four little, little exercises just to get people, you know, just get rolling. Because I, I think, yeah, it, it's kind of like, you know, I don't know, like for me, like life is more enjoyable when I feel like I'm, more intimate with my own creative process, I feel like I'm a little more alive. So, um, you know, one of my goals as an educator or, or you know, advocate of comics is to try to, you know, come up, help help people come up with ways to tap, you know, to kind of do that because we can all do it. It's just kind of getting out of our out of our own way, and uh, and I've I've tried try everything to get out of my own way. <laughs> and I've, I've tried them all. So, you know, or, or a lot of different strategies to get myself going again. Thank you. You're welcome. I think we've got time for one more question. Um, I know you had made a point in your comic about uh, the, the older man who was able to accomplish his goal, but he said something to be that he was just disappointed about you know what he set out to do versus what he was actually able to do, and I guess you personally feel that you know that has happened in your own life with your art. You know, for example, you talked about 
some of your publishing experiences and some of them early on weren't as successful. And then I guess, like, you know, how are you able to, you know, overcome, like, some of those things? Like, like, where, like, well, I think that comic in some ways was a reminder to myself to, to just enjoy and take stock of the, the things that you can accomplish and not like measure yourself against um, you know, your, your wildest aspirations, right? Like, um, so you know, when you, and, I, and, and that's a process of just always, always re reminding w oneself. Um, I'm sorry, say, did that answer your question at all? I, I, maybe not. Like, I, I, I feel um, you're just going to always, you're just going to keep, you know, and this is, you, I love peanuts, and the thing you learn from Charlie Brown is you're just going to, you're going to fail more often than not. I love baseball, like I mentioned, and boy, if you get one hit out of every three times you go to the plate, you leave the league in hitting, right? Like, so, so, you know, I think there's reminding yourself that you have to keep doing iterations, you have to keep trying and you just have to make it a practice. Um, I think that's just really, really important. Um, and then, again, once it's outside of you and, and, and you start putting those panels in the book, you know, like, start responding to that and, and, and not think of it as you. Like, so, suddenly you're having a dialogue with something that exists outside of you and, and not just, like, inside your own head. So, like, once you start, and it's, it's kind of, it's, it, it takes a little courage. Like, you know, I'm gonna just do it and I think also we, we ingest so much media, right? Like we, we, we're constantly, you know, we look at uh, minions and you know, animated shows, and then we go to sit and draw, and all that stuff looks so, you know, you know, my drawings, like I fussed over these and took a lot of work on every panel, but it looks like, oh, it must be sort of easy because it looks sort of effortless. And then we sit down and we draw, and it's like this kind of ugly, craggy thing and we don't realize, like, you know, you have to do several iterations and you have to keep working on it. Um, and and it's, it's all part of that, 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 that process. And I think there's just a gap between, yeah, what we kind of imagine ourselves doing and what we're actually able to do. Um, and I think to, to, to close that gap, you just have to kind of accept and love what you're able to do and know, you know, the more you do it, the more flexible <laughs> you will become and the better you will become. And then, and then you know, when this work starts taking on a life of its own, um, you know, th 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 that's gratifying in its own way as well. Thank you. Thank you. I, I feel like uh, I'm starting to ramble, so this is probably a good time to, <laughs> to stop. Thank you, everybody. My pleasure. And if you have any more questions, he will be here tomorrow, two floors up from 11 to 5. And we also have our second keynote speaker, Charles Hatfield, who will be speaking at 12.15. Yes. So I hope to see everyone there. Thank you so much. All right. We did it. Nice work. Was that, was that the right length? That wasn't. Perfect. Okay. He's off.